Welcome and thank you for coming to the webinar series, uh, Eye and Ear Foundation's Sight and Sound Bites. This bi-weekly webinar series started in April, believe it or not, um, of 2020. And we highlight the research at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in the departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology. Uh, today's topic is imaging the eye to diagnose and treat macular disorders. I'm Lawton Snyder, CEO of the Eye and Ear Foundation. The Eye and Ear Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck and the two world, in the two world-renowned world departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide uh, through the Eye and Ear Foundation to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support, and, uh, and we uh, appreciate all of those who have uh, made donations to support the Eye and Ear Foundation who are joining us today. Um, a little housekeeping. Uh, this is a Zoom product. You probably recognize it. I know we all do, and we, we certainly have had enough time on Zoom. But this for this product, the chat is disabled. Um, the question and answer function is available. And if you have questions during the program, we prefer that you type your questions in and please ask questions. We'd like to do those at the end, and there will be time at the end for you to ask questions. We will ask that you refrain from asking personal health questions. I won't be able to read real personal health questions, but if we can, we'll, we'll answer questions offline or after the webinar um, for any of those who, who need uh, to have a question answered. You'll receive a survey tomorrow um, uh, on today's program. We appreciate those being filled out. And then we will add people to our mailing list for future webinars. So um, today's program, first you will hear from Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel, MD, distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, exceptional class professor at Saban University Paris, I Ear Foundation Endowed Chair. He's our, our leader and uh, and uh, the 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 uh, the thrust and inspiration behind everything that we're doing here um, at in the Department of Ophthalmology at the I and Ear and through the I and Ear Foundation. And then uh, the program will be given by Jay Chablani. Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in uh, medical retinal and vitreoretinal retinal surgery. Um, Dr. Sahel, please take it away. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, we're good. Hello. So very happy to welcome you to this uh, new seminar. Uh, so the topic we are going to talk about today, we touched upon it a little bit in the past, but this is uh, really the opportunity to get into more comprehensive description of what is happening in the clinic. We are very fortunate in ophthalmology, especially in retina, but this applies also to cornea and other parts of the eye, because we can see in the living eye we, in a non-invasive way, because the patient doesn't have to be even touched uh, at the highest possible resolution, sometimes at the cellular resolution, but at least at the tissue resolution, the status of the tissue we are treating. And this is very important, not only for the diagnosis, but also to define what is left in the retina, what uh, are the remaining cells, what is the vasculature, so the blood flow. And uh, this is guiding the decision we can make. And this is also guiding the follow-up we can provide to patients. And uh, this has started many years ago. Actually, the previous chair has played an important role in that. And I've been working in that a lot in France. And now we have a wonderful team in Pittsburgh working on that, that uh, Jay will describe at the end of his presentation. And we have the opportunity to really uh, analyze extremely well what's happening in the, in the eye. Uh, and uh, Jay Shablani, I recruited him uh, not too long ago, two years ago, he's a world-class leader, he's very recognized, member already of many distinguished committees, uh, his knowledge of the choroid, the vasculature under the retina, but also his knowledge of the tissue itself and uh, the resolution and the analysis is unparalleled. He's also an expert in artificial intelligence. And he has agreed today to share his knowledge, but also his thinking about that. So I'm very happy to introduce Jay and to give him the opportunity to share with you and I'll be available at the end alongside with himself so for any question you may have. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sahil, for the kind introduction and um, INAR Foundation for giving the opportunity to discuss uh, some of the basics about macular disease uh, and the role of uh, imaging. 
let's start with uh, the picture of uh, back of the eye, which we call it as retina. As you can see here, that this is the whole picture of the retina. Uh, this is not the complete picture, but this is uh, covering almost up to, up to the far periphery. If you really start looking at it, this is a central white spot, which is the optic nerve from where the vessels are originating. And you can see that these vessels go all the way up to the periphery. Today, we are just going to focus in the central part uh, of the retina, and uh, we will talk about what is macula. So the picture now on your right is the photograph which was taken focused only in the center part of the retina. And if you look carefully, you will see that this is the circle between the two arcades, vascular arcades, and this is called macula. Macula is one of the very important part um, of the eye, which actually is responsible for the vision. But within the macula, there is a small area, which is on less than 500 um, uh, micron diameter, which is called fovea. And this is the part which is responsible for giving us 20-20 vision. So though the whole retina is important, but this is the central most area, which gives us the sharp, reading vision as well as the distance vision, which is most important for our uh, daily practice. I will just take you in a little bit more and let, uh, a brief knowledge about the histo histology here. As you can see here that retina has 10 layers and each layer is important, but the most important layer is photoreceptor layer, which is the light sensing um, uh, cells, which is present in the eye in the retina and it receives the light and makes sends the impulse through the ganglion cell through the optic nerve to the brain and this is how we are having we are able to see um, something and this is the one of the most important uh, layers of the retina i will not spend too much time on this but rather let's move on to the clinical signs and we will discuss very briefly about common macular disorders uh, which we see in our clinics uh, I'm aware that uh, Eye and Ear Foundation had a webinar on age-related macular degeneration. So just to show you again, and these are the two pictures. One, call, one is from a patient with dry AMD, and the one on the right is one patient of wet AMD. What is dry AMD when there is no fluid, there is no blood, but there is an extreme thinning of the retina and there is degeneration which is involving the center. As you can see here, that the macular area has this big patch right in the center involving the fovea. Uh, this, is, this is because of the dry macular degeneration. But if you look at the wet macular degeneration, you will see that there is this red blood underneath here, and we will come to the fluid part again as we move forward with the investigations. So when you have bleeding and the fluid and the swelling, this is called wet, wet macular degeneration. Unfortunately, we still do not have any treatment for dry macular degeneration. People have tried many supplements and the results are not very promising. And we are really happy that Dr. Sahel is very much involved in, in developing a retinal implant for dry macular degeneration. And we have we are already started this trial uh, at UPMC and we are seeing um, good uh, initial results uh, at present. About the wet macular degeneration, we have multiple anti-VEGF injections. I think some of you must be aware of this, that there are three types of injections which are being used and many of these patients require um, monthly injections and we we like to see them regularly and follow them up closely just to prevent further vision loss let's move on to the next common disease called diabetic retinopathy as you can see in this picture there are these yellow deposits right in the central area these are called hard exudates or cholesterol deposits which is very common uh, in patients with diabetic diabetic retinopathy along with this they have a retinal edema and these patients with diabetic retinopathy also can have the blood, as you can see here, which, which can lead to further retinal detachment, which is hemorrhage and more complicated advanced diabetic retinopathy. And this is where we uh, raise a, um, 
an importance for early diagnosis in this disease so we can prevent the progression and prevent the further vision loss. Let's move on to the next uh, disease called central serous chorioretinopathy. As you can see that uh, the retina looks okay, except that these patients tend to have this fluid pocket right in the center. This disease is not spoken much uh, commonly. However, this is one of the common causes for vision loss, especially in young people. I'll be touching upon this again once we move forward with the presentation. One more common disease which we see in the clinic is the macular hole. Again, the patient presents with a recent vision loss, particularly the central vision. And these patients usually require surgical intervention. Uh, you, you guys must have heard about vitrectomy and gas injection and phase down position. These are the common approaches we treat our macular hole patients. Moving on to another important disease which involves macula is called epiretinal membrane or ERM. As you can see on this picture, right in the center of the macula, you have this um, yellowish membrane right on the top of the retina, which is what causes distortion to the patient. And most of our patients present with some distortion, especially about, while reading. And this disease also requires surgical intervention in the form of vitrectomy and membrane removal. Let's move on to the common imaging tools which we use in our clinic. I will start with fluorescein angiography. Fluorescein angiography is a very simple technique. However, we need to uh, give the dye through one of the peripheral veins as you can see in this picture and take the photographs of the eye as you can see on the monitor here in this picture. So what we get here is the blood supply uh, details about the retina, you can see that if there is any leakage, if there is any further damage, if there is any poor blood supply. Let's look at some of the diseases which we just discussed. This is a, a fluorescein angiography of a patient with wet macular degeneration. You can see here that this is a membrane under the retina, which is clearly seen. Uh, you, can, you can easily compare with the healthy eye and you can see that how this membrane is right under the retina and which is the most common cause for vision loss and these patients have leakage and, and distortion and this disease requires injections as I was discussing before. So we use fluorescein angiography primarily to understand the activity of this membrane in wet macular degeneration. Let's move on to the next common disease, diabetic retinopathy. You can see here that how the fluorescein angiography is showing us these poor blood supply area. There are these multiple white dots and we tend to look for these leaky blood vessels which can lead to bleeding, which we call it as vitreous hemorrhage and further complications related to diabetic retinopathy. Therefore, again, fluorescein angiography helps us to understand and find these um, leaky blood vessels at a much earlier stage. So we start the treatment and prevent worsening of the disease and prevent further vision loss. This is a picture uh, uh, of a patient with a CSCR as I was showing you in the previous image that you, these patients present with a fluid pocket in the center. We do an fluorescein angiography and we try to find any leakage in these patients which requires some, some sort of treatment which I'll be talking a little bit uh, in brief uh, again. Let's move on to the next imaging tool. Again, very important. This is called OCT, optical coherence tomography. I'm sure that many of you must have heard about this, this, uh, this uh, imaging tool. This is a pretty non-invasive way of uh, uh, taking images. This is primarily a scan of the retina, almost giving us a histological uh, picture of the retina, as you can see here, that on the top is, is the retina and the bottom is the choroid. I'll be talking a little bit about the choroid, which is the layer under the retina. We will talk about this a little bit later. If you really look at the retina, you are seeing that you can appreciate multiple layers of the retina. This is almost as good as, as, good as seeing on the histology. Let's look at some of the common diseases where we use OCT. One of the very common disease is diabetic retinopathy. Here you can clearly appreciate that how this normal dip, which because of the fovea, which I was describing in the beginning, 
that this is the central dip, which is called fovea, and this dip is completely lost in diabetic retinopathy because there is fluid accumulation, there is swelling of the retina, and we are going to follow up these patients by giving injections. We like to do these OCTs very often just to understand the response to treatment. And the best part with this, with this imaging tool is that this is a non-invasive uh, imaging tool, which gives us a very good information about the OCT helps us to define and um, the treatment plan and retreatment, and if you really want to switch between the drugs and for the decision. This is again a very important uh, disease, dry AMD and wet AMD. As you can see, when we do an OCT in the dry AMD patients, there is no fluid, but you can see that how the retina is thinned out so much. There is so much damage to the central part and which is the most common reason for the vision loss in these patients with dry macular degeneration. If you look at the OCT of the wet macular degeneration, you are able to appreciate that there is swelling of the retina. There is some blood, which we can see on the color photos. The blood is seen again on the OCT. You can see that there is some fluid accumulation. And this is something which is very important for our wet macular degeneration patients because we like to follow them up doing OCTs almost every month in the beginning to understand the response to the treatment and if they need a switch between the drugs as well. Let's move on to the to CSCR, as I was saying before, that there is a fluid accumulation in this disease right in the center. And you can see that how the foveal, foveal area is elevated because there is a fluid right under the retina. And you can see that how the whole uh, contour of the retina is distorted. And this is the reason for the distortion um, for the patients when they are specially reading. So we, we do these OCTs to understand the extent of the disease and see further uh, damage, which happens mainly when you're following up these patients in chronic cases. And we do the treatment in, forms of, in the form of laser. And then we follow up these patients with OCT and understand if there is a resolution of the fluid or not. Let me show you something more interesting, which are newer imaging tools. For example, this is wide field fluorescein angiography. And we have this at UPMC and you can see that how this fluorescein angiography, which I was showing you before, was focused only in the central area. But by doing the wide field fluorescein angiography, we can see almost the whole extent of the retina. And many of the macular diseases have these findings in the periphery, which are important. And we like to do a wide field fluorescein angiography, particularly in patients with diabetic retinopathy, where the blood supply could be really poor in the periphery, which needs some attention. And we can find out these leaky vessels in the far periphery. So this is something very interesting. It is a newer tool, which we are using in the clinic, and we find it very useful. Let me talk about something more interesting called OCT angiography. So by now you have learned what is OCT, which is a non-invasive scan of the eye. And we spoke about fluorescein angiography, which is the invasive test. We inject the dye, take the picture, but the OCT angiography is like a combination of these two without any injections, without any invasive nature. So if you really look at these pictures, they are almost looking like and geography, which we were seeing through fluorescein, but these are the very interesting images which we obtained without using any dye and you can get all the vascular information, which is depth encoded. That means you can actually see a different levels of the vessels in the retina, which we, are, we were unable to see using fluorescein or any conventional dye-based angiography. So this is something very important in today's day. We are trying to use it and incorporate in our clinical practice in, in every patient. So we learn about them and we use these uh, OCD angiography images for following up our patients, particularly wet macular degeneration. So we can understand how the vascular network, the abnormal vessels are responding to our treatment, which we were not able to do just because we would not like to do dye-based invasive angiography every month. By using these techniques, we can actually follow them up in a much um, better way and, and much more closely. What if you really take this OCT angiography to the whole field? 
And now you, this is wide field OCT angiography. Again, we have this uh, at UPMC, and now we are exploring this technique in looking at the periphery of many patients without doing any dye-based angiography. And we are seeing that this is almost as good as uh, doing a fluorescein angiography, and we get much more information without injecting any dye. And this is something very, very innovative and interesting. Uh, something more, if you really look at this picture by now, you know that this is a fundus picture of the macular area. But what if I really ask you that, can you tell me the detail about that small black block, which I put the rectangle? Can you tell me the details about that area? We are unable to talk much more detail about this. So what we do is that we use adaptive optics, which is being run by Dr. Rossi at UPMC. And this is a very innovative, advanced retinal imaging, much higher resolution. I'll just show you that what if I really go in the deeper into this block, we can see the cellular structure much more clearly. What if I really focus on the white rectangle of the second image, you will see that now we are able to see individual photoreceptor cells. These are rods and cones, which we cannot see with any imaging modality uh, other than adaptive optics. This is something very interesting. It is almost bringing a telescope and fitting into the eye and trying to see the cellular structure uh, of the eye in, an, in a non-invasive manner. And we use this technique mainly for our dystrophy patients and for patients where we really cannot understand why the, the patient is losing vision. So this is still a research uh, imaging modality. Dr. Rossi is a world expert in this. And just to add some more that there are only few sites across the world who have this uh, ability to image the retina using adaptive optics. Let me take you a little more deeper into the choroid as I was talking about the retina so far, just to tell you that the choroid is the layer which is under the retina. As you can see the yellow uh, uh, highlights, this is the layer under the retina. To just explain to you further that if you really go deeper and really open up the eye, you will see that the choroid is the layer under the retina, which is primarily made with vascular. This is the this is the most vascular structure of the eye. And if you really look at the histology, you will see it is mainly made up of vessels. And why it is so important? Because this is the this is the layer which supplies to the photoreceptor, which I was talking about in the beginning. And the photoreceptors are the most important cells in the eye, in the retina. So the choroid plays a very important role by supplying nutrition and oxygen to these photoreceptor cells, which are very important uh, for vision. I have particular interest about choroidal disorders. I'm not going to the, to, into the details. And now we understand that AMD is also considered as choroidal disorders. Polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy is one another form of AMD. I will not talk too much into the detail, but I'll just take you to a common disease called central serous chorioretinopathy, which I have been referring as CSCR. This is a disease where you have fluid pocket in the macular area and the patient present to us with distortion. How do you know distortion? If some of you might have seen this Emsler's grid, this is something very common, which you can do it at home. And most of the most of the patients with macular disease will have some form of distortion of these straight lines on the Hemsler's grid. Sometimes these, these are the earliest signs of any macular disease. And CSR is a perfect example because patients with CSR can have 2020 vision, but they can have a distorted 2020. So this is a very good test. For any macular disease patients, you can follow up uh, with your doctor. You can have this at home and do this weekly, and you will know if there is any change. Let's go back to CSCR. And as I showed you before, that if you do a fluorescein angiography in these patients, you might see some leakage, as we can see on the rightmost picture. And we use fluorescein angiography to understand the leakage so we can offer treatment. So this is an OCT scan, I think you have seen May, uh, this before. This is a normal OCT scan where the retina and the choroid is looking good. But if you look at the OCT scan of a patient with CSCR, you can see that there is some fluid accumulation, distortion of the foveal contour, and this is what 
makes these patients very symptomatic. So what are the treatment options for these patients? Many of the, the patients with acute presentation, they resolve on its own. That's why we don't offer them any treatment right in the beginning, but we usually observe them for two, two to three months. And if they really don't resolve, then we take them up for fluorescein angiography and try to understand the disease in more detail. And then we offer them either a laser treatment or a photodynamic therapy, or nowadays we are using some oral medications as well. So it, this is becoming a very common disease, particularly in young patients. And this disease is supposed to have a very strong relationship with type A personality and stress. So we are seeing these patients and the prevalence of this disease is increasing uh, every year. Uh, I'll just take you very briefly through some of my research, uh, which I have done in the past. And we are trying to establish choroid lab at UPMC by involving imaging team and basic scientists. So at UPMC, we are trying to establish many choroidal biomarkers by using these uh, in vivo imaging technique, as you can see that how we are trying to quantify the choroidal changes. So which we are already using many of these biomarkers in the clinic and trying to follow up and learn more about um, these patients in respect to the, the choroid. The ultimate goal is to actually come up with a re 3D reconstruction of the choroid so we can actually pinpoint uh, any abnormal choroidal blood vessel, which is the cause for uh, this disease. So this is something very exciting for us called choroidal holography. As you can see that um, the video is showing you the deeper structures, deeper blood vessels so clearly, and you'll be surprised that uh, these are non-invasive images and which, which is giving us so much information about the choroidal vessels. This is called choroidal holography. Uh, in collaboration with um, uh, Paris and Dr. Sahel support, we are trying to uh, bring this device here at UPMC, and we are trying to bring this um, uh, into our research uh, choroid lab, and uh, hopefully we will learn much more about this uh, complex structure. These are some of the references. I have, up, uh, I have taken some of the pictures from the internet just to make it very simple for the audience. Um, and this is the imaging team at UPMC, Dr. Dan Singhani, Dr. Rossi, who is the in charge for adaptive optics lab, uh, Dr. Ian Sigal, who is uh, involved in uh, many of the glaucoma imaging work. With this, I would like to thank each of you for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Dr. Chablani, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, there's a lot there and there's a lot that um, is very new to someone even like myself who's been listening to a lot of presentations over a lot of period of time. And I think it's very fascinating how much of this related to the choroid has an impact um, that maybe was less understood. Is a lot of that impact due to the onset of better imaging that we're understanding it better? Is that why we know more? Yeah, with, with, uh, I would say in the last couple of years, because our imaging abilities are increasing, so we are able to see much deeper structure. And this is where the choroid has become into the, has become a focus for most of the research uh, in this area. Fantastic. So we are open for questions. Um, as I said, I think I have a few. So, um, in, but in the meantime, we have a few that have been written in and I'll get to those. But this, uh, please folks, if you'd like to ask a question, just click on the Q&A down below and you can type in your question. Um, good opportunity to ask some really, you know, uh, um, really renowned experts who are, you know, very specialized in this particular area. So um, first question is, um, how often should a patient with AMD undergo uh, these detailed types of imaging? I, I would say that uh, if you are already seeing a retina specialist, so they are aware that what is the extent of the disease you have and how often do you need to be seen by them. So if you have a wet macular degeneration, I particularly ask the patient to come almost monthly in the beginning. And if the response is good, then we can extend the follow-up from two months to four months, depending upon the disease state. 
So I think it would be really important to see your retina specialist and follow their advice because very unfortunately, many of these patients, if they skip the visits, they have the vision loss, they have further vision loss. And the biggest challenge which we all face with this particular disease is that in spite of the best treatment, we are unable to regain the vision which you have lost. So it is important to see your physician as soon as possible if you have any vision change, so at least we can save what vision you have. Well, thank you. Now this would be, and I'm interested in the answer to this, but should people with a family history of AMD receive detailed imaging as a preventative test? I'll, I'll, I'll ask as someone who has family history of, uh, of AMD. Dr. Sahil, would you like to take a question? <laughs> uh, up to you. I mean, I mean uh, uh, we know that there is a, a genetic component to the disease. Uh, we know actually of uh, several genes, especially three of them are major components. And uh, this is one of the best understood the complex disease with genetic determinants. But the fact of having a genetic uh, background doesn't make you uh, sick by itself. Uh, there is a lot of environmental uh, elements like the food you are taking, the exposure to light, smoking, that can make the risk much higher. So it's always advisable to have, a, to be, to have a retina checked around 50 or 55, just to look whether there are some deposits on some early determinants of uh, age-related macular degeneration. Although at this stage, it's not really a degeneration, it's just deposits. And many people have some deposits in the retina don't have any disease and will not have any disease. So it just, uh, it's just probably important to get this checked once and then depending on the findings, having a follow-up uh, over time. But uh, there is no, uh, I mean, there's it's nothing which is predetermined that uh, some people, because their parents had the disease, they will have it. There is a, a bit higher risk and this is why it's wise to, to be checked for that. And uh, especially now that we know that some vitamins can help in delaying the onset of the disease and the, the pace of the disease, it's uh, good to know. And also to know that you should protect yourself against light, avoid smoking. So some advice can be given at that time. Thank you. Um, so if someone has dry AMD, should this person be checked for choroid disorder as well? Um, uh, I, I think that um, yeah, the choroid is, I'm glad to hear this question, but uh, I think AMD is considered as the choroidal disorder because one of the blood vessel layers of the choroid, I did not get into the detail of that, is affected in this disease. So there is still a lot of research we need to do that which layer gets affected. So if you are seeing your retina specialist and you are diagnosed as dry AMD, so they are pretty much aware that what they are looking at, and I'm sure they are offering you the right treatment. So you really don't need a choroid specialist for that. Your retina specialist knows the answer. So this is interesting. Why uh, can patients sometimes see visual defects, but yet the imaging tools cannot find these? This is again, a very interesting question. And you know, uh, uh, over, I, I have seen the field of retina and imaging growing in the last 10 years. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Sahil has seen for many decades, but now we are definitely seeing things which we were not able to see. And one of the very interesting tool is adaptive optics, Dr. Rossi's lab. That is something which we are really hopeful to find some of the answers like these, where, where our conventional imaging is not able to see, but these fine high resolution imaging is able to contribute and explain uh, us some of the que unanswered questions. Okay, and uh, well, someone who uh, joined late asked if, if uh, we can rewatch these presentations. I'll share this with everybody. You can. Uh, these, all of our webinars are, are recorded and we will be posting in a few days on our website. So you'll find that on our website at www.ionear.org. So um, what is the um, injection of choice for new onset wet AMD? Uh, Dr. Sahil, would you like to take this? Yeah, so uh, there is no injection of choice. I mean, uh, currently there are several drugs that are available and they are all quite effective. Uh, some patients would be better responders to one of the drugs versus the others. Uh, sometimes we know that in advance and this is what we propose to the patient, but most often they are kind of equivalent. So uh, we are currently actually, uh, we have a protocol in the department to really make sure that we provide 
the initial drug and monitor the efficiency. And if we have to adjust the treatment to make it more efficient, we do that uh, over time. But there is no drug that is currently much better than any other one. So the three drugs that are on the market and there are more to come uh, are very good. And they made a big difference. We'll talk about that maybe. Uh, I saw another question relating to vision, uh, vision restoration. This, has, this was a game changer. I can tell you that when in 20, 2005, all of a sudden we had these drugs available, it changed our lives and it changed the lives of many people. It's not a total cure, but it's a big difference. So we have pretty good drugs. The most important is that this is part of a protocol. There is no magic bullet that is curing the disease. It's important to do the injection. It's important to do the imaging, the vision testing, and to decide when to do the next injection and the follow-up, because this is really a partnership between the patient and the physician that takes, over, that takes really in charge the disease for many years and sometimes a decade. And, I, and you partially answered, I think, the next question, which is related to what MD is there hope for restoration of vision loss uh, or, or is the best that can be expected to stabilize the vision loss? And I think a good opportunity to talk about a lot, some of the other research we're doing, Dr. Sahal, related to uh, restoration. Yeah, the good thing is that a, a proportion of the patients, when they once they get the first injection and after the injection, they not only have a stabilization of the vision, but they have some improvement because the fluid that uh, Dr. Shablani was demonstrating can be decreased by the injection, and this can correlate with some improvement in vision, not getting back to normal, but a pretty pretty significant improvement in a proportion of the patient, not all of them. And then it's stabilization. Uh, when the uh, treatment is not working, uh, which is, I would say, rare, can happen, but it's rare, uh, then obviously this is where research can help. Currently, the uh, restoration of vision through artificial retina, we are developing it for atrophic AMD, not for the wet form of AMD. It may be useful in the future, but currently it's really targeting this group of patients where, as Dr. Shablani said, we, we have, there is no treatment currently. So it's the only uh, hope for the, the near future. Doesn't mean that there are not other hopes, but more, long, more longer term. Uh, so uh, restoration is really occurring sometimes after the injection. We should never forget that rehabilitation is also part of the management. We are very fortunate in the department. We have Dr. Smith, we have uh, uh, also uh, Dr. Holly Stans, who is helping us a lot with uh, all the approaches to help patients to cope with residual vision, because the, any type of vision we can protect, any area of fixation in the eye can be used much better with this rehabilitation uh, uh, pro pro protocols and devices. So it's a combination of a therapy and rehabilitation. And this is what we try to do. It's more a holistic approach to the disease. Would the same issues happen in each eye, with these conditions? Uh, it is possible that these patients, particularly the, the macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, CSCR, these, these diseases tend to have a bilateral um, involvement. So if you have one eye which is affected by any of these diseases, so it is, it is definitely important to follow up, uh, up for the, the other eye as well, because they tend to involve both eyes. It is important. And would, um, did I understand this, uh, that distortion can be corrected is the next question. I, I, I think that it all depends upon how uh, significant distortion you have, what is the status of the retina. For example, if you have a, a CSCR or some fluid at the, mac at the foveal area, which is very fresh and it resolves, then your distortion also may get uh, corrected completely. But if you have an epiretinal membrane, which is leading to distortion, which has been there for a really long time, we go ahead and remove the membrane by doing the surgery. So it's still possible that the distortion may be reduced, but may not go completely. So it is important that it all depends upon the severity of the disease. And this is a very important message that whenever you have any of such symptoms, you should see your doctor or retina specialist as soon as possible so they know when to intervene. So I think this is very important to see at that time. Well, thank you. Are there any updates on the continuing study of the benefits of the AREED2 vitamins for AMD patients? Dr. Sahil? 
Uh, well, you can, you can do it also. Actually, Dr. Freiberg, who was on the previous uh, webinar, was uh, instrumental in this study. Uh, Pittsburgh I play, has played an important role in this study. So actually, it's only one, it's not one study, it's uh, many studies. And if you look at the number of papers and publications and the impact this has had on the field, this is very significant. So there is still a continued follow up, but the message remains the same. This cocktail of vitamins can delay the, the onset of a disease, but more important, actually when patients have already developed a disease, can delay the aggravation, the exacerbation of a disease in the range of 20%, which means uh, can be several years of a change in the optimal vision. So this is a continuous message, it has not changed, and uh, these vitamins are very useful. Okay, can someone with, and I've heard this question before too, can someone with cataracts and early dry AMD have surgery to remove the cataracts? Yeah, yeah, I, I think they, they, they definitely can undergo cataract removal if uh, their physician finds the cataract significant. Uh, there is definitely some learning which we have had in the last few years that what is the impact of cataract surgery on AMD, but it all depends upon the status of the severity of the AMD. But I would say that doing a cataract surgery with a dry AMD should not uh, lead to further damage. So they can definitely uh, plan for the cataract surgery. Yeah, I may add to that, that uh, obviously any surgery has to be done by a very good surgeon so that they can minimize the duration of the surgery and the amount of light that they are using. Also, there are specific intraocular lenses that are filtering some of the light. So it's uh, always good when you have early signs of AMD to use this type of lenses and the surgeons would know that and the department we certainly are very careful with that. The other thing uh, which I don't want to get into too many details is that currently there are on the market multifocal lenses that are used to, uh, uh, for presbyopia to not to have to wear spectacles to read. Uh, and this does not, uh, it's not advisable to use that if you have an early AMD because uh, this can reduce the contrast sensitivity. So this is a discussion to have with your physician, uh, UPMC or outside UPMC to make sure that you make the right choice in terms of the implant and in terms of uh, what type of uh, lens you are going to get implanted. Okay, um, another question here. It looks like our last one, but what percentage of people with dry AMD go on to develop wet AMD? Uh, maybe I'll try to start that. Actually, there is a misnomer because the dry AMD does cover two types of disease. There is the early stage of a disease that we call actually age-related maculopathy. It's not really a degeneration. It's just the accumulation of deposit. And many people call that dry AMD. Uh, but actually the real dry AMD is when the atrophy is occurring, this is the late form of the disease. So it can happen that the patient with an atrophic form of the disease develops new vessels. You can have in one eye new vessels and be override an atrophic form. But uh, a lot of confusion in the literature and the, in the public is that the early form of AMD is also called dry AMD, uh, but actually it's uh, only deposits and uh, it's uh, not the same, it's not at all the same type of disease. Many people have 20-20 vision, normal vision with the early stages. So there is no reason to worry, just reasons to be followed at that stage. Okay, I, I always learn something myself on these things. So thank you, that, that was a good explanation. So um, I, it looks like that's all of our questions, but uh, thank you. Thank you to the audience, but also thank you of course to our presenters today. Um, and I, let me emphasize again, you know, we're, we're really fortunate here in Pittsburgh, but we, we obviously are broadcasting this to uh, people throughout the country. Um, our focus is clearly on, on solving problems for vision um, and through research. And, and that's what the Ioneer Foundation has been doing for 35 years. But we're also now, um, you know, in a really wonderful position to make a, a, a tremendous impact because of what this team is doing and what Dr. Sahel and his, um, it, it has developed here in terms of strength of, of, of research and clinical faculty that are working here. So this is an example of that. And, uh, and we'll continue to bring you these um, as we have promised. And uh, we'll look forward to another presentation in four weeks for ophthalmology. But in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking again with, uh, with you about what we're doing on the uh, ENT side, otolaryngology side. So thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll look forward to uh, more conversation. Thank you. Thank you.